I'd like to call the meeting to order. It is 10 a.m. September 13th, and we are the ta uh, Towing Storage and Advisory Board. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Anna to do a roll call for us, please. Yes, ma'am. Kyle Jackson. Present. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Tasha Mora. Present. Gary Hoffman. Here. Charles Rash. Present. Ken Ulmer. Here. Mark Mitchell. Here. And presiding officer Amy Milstead. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Okay, before we get started, I would like to remind everyone to please mute your microphone. Only unmute it when you are going to speak. And then also remember to announce your name. I'm terrible at this, but if we could announce our name, it sure helps the records on there. All right, now that's going to take us to the approval of minutes. You should have all gotten your minutes in the packet that was sent out to you prior to the meeting. Um, I think we need to turn it over um, for a motion to approve the minutes. So the Homer. we need to do is the August 23rd, 2022 minutes. Uh, since they weren't approved last time, I forgot. I had some errors in the last one, so we're going to approve both of them. So if somebody is making a motion, can you be specific on uh, the date? So the first one is August 23rd, uh, 2022. Anna, I didn't receive the packet. Can you email that over to me real quick, please? Of course, I'll do that right now for you. Should we wait for him or should we go ahead and approve the minutes? We can, um, <clears throat> excuse me, we can postpone it. Uh, we can move it later down onto the agenda if you'd like. Okay, that's um, in agreements with everybody. Okay. Yeah. okay, we'll circle back to that after public comment if that will give Gary enough time to look over it. Um, okay, that's going to take us to public comment. We have three public comments today. Board members, I believe you got those in your packet to review and see what they're wanting to discuss and who they are and what they, who the company or the organization that they represent. So, did we ever have Trevor Forbes join us or should we move to the next one? Uh, no, ma'am, he has not joined yet. All right. That will take us to the second one. Mr. Lewis, are you with us? Hello, yes, I'm here. Okay, Mr. Lewis, thank you for being here today. When you begin speaking, will you please state your name and who you represent? Reminder, you have three minutes to speak. Please understand the board members are not allowed to ask any questions or engage in this discussion with you. Uh, please be specific on the agenda. Do you understand your instructions? Yes, I do. All right, your three minutes will start when you're ready. All right, thank you, TDLR and Advisory Board. My name is Ronnie Lewis, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself. And I wanted to speak on private tows and also comment on the, comp the complaint process with TDLR. Sorry about that, my dryer just went off. Um, about a year ago, my car was towed, and after it was towed, I filed for a tow hearing and I was successful in proving before the court that there was no probable cause for my vehicle to be towed. And afterwards, upon getting an order from the judge that there was no probable cause, I then filed a complaint with TDL with TDLR. And I know from prior videos that you're not supposed to speak about complaints and investigations, but my particular complaint was closed and stated there was no further investigation which I went back and watched additional board meetings, which lead me to ask your question. If someone files a complaint and states that their vehicle was towed and they were successful in proving that there was no probable cause for the vehicle to be towed, why is the complaint closed and you're told there's no need for further investigation? Because I've gone back and watched a few prior board meetings. In particular, I went back and watched last month's meeting and I listened to Elizabeth speak and she stated that TDLR takes the complaints from consumers very seriously. However, when I filed my complaint, it was closed and I was told there's no need for further investigation because what I was complaining of is a civil matter. However, if someone mentions that their car was towed and they were successful in their tow hearing, does TDLR not take a moment to ask additional questions about what happened at the hearing to see if maybe a violation took place to correct action that may need to be addressed? So, Mr. Lewis, the, mm -hmm. we can comment on things that aren't on the agenda, but I can tell you 
we will follow up. We will have someone within the department, probably enforcement, follow up. Uh, I assure everyone that we do take complaints from consumers very seriously. There may have been a specific reason why the investigation into your situation was closed, but we will follow up with you and, and have further discussion about it. Okay. All right, Mr. Lewis, thank you for your time and your co comments to the board. We do appreciate you being here. Thank you. All right, next, that's going to take us to Mr. Grubbs. Mr. Grubbs, thank you for being here. When you begin speaking as well, please state your name and who you represent. You're going to have three minutes to speak. Um, please understand that board members are not allowed to engage or ask any questions. Um, do you have do you understand these instructions? Yes. All right, your three minutes will start as soon as you're ready. All right, first off, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Ed Grubbs. I'm the president of Environmental Chemical Solutions. Tommy Anderson from the Tow Association asked me to talk with you today. I'd first like to thank all of you for taking the time to understand the multiple hazards a damaged EV presents to public safety. Damaged batteries can short circuit, catch fire, and even explode. Lithium ion batteries burn much hotter and faster than other fuel sources and can reignite after the fire is extinguished. Because of the electrolytes used in an EV battery, hexafluorophosphate and dimethylcarbonate, any disruption throughout the high voltage system can cause any battery cell to short circuit and go into thermal runaway. The electrolyte creates the fire and toxic gases. All studies have shown the toxic gases released by these battery fires pose serious risks to human health. These gases include hydrogen fluoride, which can cause respiratory problems and other severe health effects. It can be absorbed through the lungs and the skin. Thermal runaway can occur from any short circuiting, especially accidents. Once thermal runaway begins, which can occur many days post accident, 45 days have been reported, the battery can ignite and reignite. These fires have taken hours and even days to extinguish using traditional firefighting with water up to 40,000 gallons. Uncontained, the toxic gases are an issue and the massive amount of water used can contaminate property and put significant levels of pollution into stormwater. This creates serious issues with NPDES permits. Agencies are focused on the fire danger of EV. The focus needs to be on the safe storage and prevention. Preventing thermal runaway or stopping it reduces or eliminates the health, safety, and environmental concerns. Due to the extreme temperature these batteries burn at, the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration and NFPA have published interim guidance to have at least 50 feet clear radius around the vehicle. If the tow yard followed this guidance, it would probably be the only vehicle in the storage yard. However, studies have shown that submerging the EV battery will stop thermal runaway, stopping the battery from burning. Containment and preventing ignition becomes key to protecting the public. Making wrong decisions due to lack of knowledge or being in a rush can result in serious injury and significant loss of property. The TDLR should partner with the Energy Security Agency to identify which vehicles at an, in an accident pose a serious potential problem at the scene. It is important to protect the consumer and the IMT. Therefore, we must identify the high-risk vehicles and follow the guidelines established by NHTSA utilizing the best available technology. There are currently units available for containment, prevention, and firefighting, but these are costly to the IMT. There is much more to discuss about this, and we don't have time for it today. We would be more than happy to meet with you again and delve further into this subject or answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Grubbs. Very informative. Mm -hmm. We appreciate you being here today, and um, thank you for your public comments. Thank you so much, guys. Amy, I think our Chief of Staff, Jessica Escobar, would like to say something in response to the comment. Thank you, Elizabeth, Presiding Officer, um, and Mr. Grubbs, Chief of Staff, Jessica Escobar. Um, if I may, we are actually in the process of implementing or beginning the implementation of our electric vehicle charging station bill. So that's going to be a very long process for us. And right now, um, as far as that bill is related to, we're, we're, we're focused on registration and other things. But as far as the tow industry, which the bill does not specifically focus on, we do know that we're going to need our, our tow industry and, and VSF partners as we look to implement that bill. So please be on the lookout for our request for guidance and insight from you all later as this process evolves. So if I there's anything we that. can do, if there's anything we can do, please let us know. We'll follow up with all industry members. So thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate you um, coming in there. Ms. All right. That's like Mr. Forbes has uh, come into our meeting. If you would like to give him the opportunity to speak. Absolutely. I saw him pop in there. All right. Good morning, Mr. Forbes. Thank you for being here today. Um, when you're speaking, please say your name and who you represent. You have three minutes to speak. Please understand the board members are not allowed to engage, ask any questions or have any discussion with you on your topic. Do you understand your instructions? OK, I think you're on mute. So your three minutes will start as soon as you're ready. Can you hear us OK, Mr. Forbes? Mr. Forbes, can you hear me at all? Okay, great. Um, if you're having uh, audio issues, go up to the menu bar at the very top, click on that audio and video button, and then click on audio settings and make sure that your mic is up. That may be an issue that you're having. Up now. We can hear you. Yes, thank you, sir. All right, there we go. Got to love WebEx. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the rest of the board appreciate it. I'll be very brief. Um, first, I just wanted to again uh, thank TLR staff uh, for addressing the issue on the uh, uh, CPI calculations. I know that was was painful, but it'll be very helpful to the industry. So that we appreciate all the hard work on that. And um, my understanding is that uh, we're kind of all on the same page now <laughs> regarding the calculations. Um, and so the only request would be to um, try to, um, within the, the framework of the rules, expedite those changes as quickly as possible. Um, the industry, especially small operators um, who are mostly concerned about it in, um, you know, short change, not on purpose, but have been short changed for actually a couple of years now. Um, and so every month counts. There's a lot of small operators out there that are providing services to law enforcement agencies that are very important. Um, and it may seem like a small amount, um, you know, a couple cents or a dollar here and there. Uh, may seem inconsequential, but for operators running on very tight margins, it is extremely important. Um, so we just ask that that's expedited as quickly as possible. And again, we appreciate all the uh, hard work staff has done on rectifying this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Forbes. And again, I'd like to thank Mr. Lewis, Mr. Forbes and Mr. Grubbs for joining us today. I see they're already off, but um, if they can hear us. Um, again, anyone wishing to address the board with a public comment, you need to submit that public comment in advance to the board liaison. That email is board.comments at tdlr.texas.gov. So please send those in. We enjoy hearing from others and um, what the industry can do to help you. Okay, um, Gary, have you had time to review the minutes? Okay, super. So I'd like to go back to the minutes if we can. I'm going to ask for an approval of the minutes from August the 23rd 1st. That's what's on my agenda. So August the 23rd, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve. Ken Ulmer makes the motion to approve the minutes from August 23rd, 2022 and August 3rd, 2023. We can do that together. Yes, sir. Go ahead. <laughs> I need a second out I'll there. Second Gary Hoffman. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, way to go, Ken. Do them both at once. We have a motion in a second. Um, all in favor? Would you like me to do a roll call vote for you, ma'am? Please. That's fine. Okay. Kyle Jackson. Aye. Tasha Mora. Aye. Gary Hoffman. Aye. Charles Rush. Aye. Ken Ulmer. Aye. Mark Mitchell. Aye. And presiding officer Amy Milstead. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, we're going to move along to item agenda F. I do believe we're back on track now. This brings me to our favorite part of my, the, the meeting. I love hearing from the staff and everything going on. So we will start with the licensing division. Rusty Salazar, if you would like to take it over. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, Rusty Salazar, I am going to be doing the staff meeting today for Laura Hernandez. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you should have in front of you the report uh, for this last quarter. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have the fourth quarter final numbers uh, available for us before uh, today. Uh, before this was came up, but we will have all those numbers for you for our next meeting. Um, as you can see, they're really 
from the last meeting, there weren't very many changes at all because of the fact that, you know, we it wasn't that long ago that we had a meeting. Okay, board members, do you have any questions for Rusty? Well, you got off light today, Mr. I Sikon guess Park. so. Wow. <laughs> okay. Great. Last call. Any more questions for him? Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Rusty. We appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to education examination. Michael Strawn, are you with us this morning? Yes, ma'am. Good morning, Chair and members. My name is Michael Strawn. I'm one of the managers for our Education Examination Division. I'm here to give you your report today, as you'll see, with uh, our total course approvals and number of courses. We've remained pretty consistent throughout um, everything with uh, literal no changes in the number of curriculum approval. Uh, moving on down, we'll have the CE invoicing. Um, this is kind of a breakdown of what you'll see for the amount of CE invoicing that we have each month up to the quarter. Uh, kind of what you heard from licensing, we unfortunately didn't have the time to gather the August data uh, in time for y'all's report due to when these reports were due. Um, with that being said, that concludes my report and I'm open to any questions y'all may have. Board members, any questions for Michael? Everyone's still asleep this morning. Okay, thank you, Michael, for your time. We do appreciate you. Yes, ma'am. All right, we will move on to customer service division. Claudia Enriquez, I think you can take over from here. Hi, good morning and advisory board members. My name is Claudia Enriquez and I am the manager for this program. As you can see from the statistics report in front of you, fiscal year 2023, shows that contacts peaked in the month of March with a total of 2,252 contacts for the pro program. For fiscal year 2022, our report shows contacts peaked in the month of February with a total of 2,234 contacts. So compared to fiscal year 2022, fiscal year 2023 does show a decrease in uh, amount of total contacts. Other than those statistics, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions from our board? Okay. Any ideas what you attribute this to? Um, why the why the calls are kind of balancing out a little bit? I'm not sure to be honest with you. Um, licensed uh, licenses are being processed rather quickly, so maybe there's just a um, less amount of people calling for their li license status requests. Well, that's good. It's good for the industry and great for you guys. Less phone yes, calls and, and inquiries is even better, huh? Yes, of course. Okay, any other questions? Thank you, Claudia. We appreciate your help. Have a great day. Thanks, you too. All right. Enforcement Division, Ms. Natalie Olvera. Good morning, advisory board members. My name is Natalie Olvera. I'm a prosecutor in the Enforcement Division, and I'll be presenting Enforcement's report to you today. Uh, first, we have the statistics through July of fiscal year 2023. Of tow and BSF cases closed, approximately 7% and 11% of those respective cases have resulted in disciplinary action, which would include commission orders, default orders, and agreed orders. These numbers are staying on trend with past statistics. Again, it's only been one month um, since the last uh, meeting. Uh, for case highlights, two cases have been added to your packet to provide examples of complaint cases resolved by the department. Ms. Moore, we haven't forgotten about the additional statistics that uh, were asked for in the last meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but because again of the quick turnaround and the end of the fiscal year, um, the additional statistics were not available for this meeting. Um, and that's the end of enforcement's report. I'm available if you have any questions. Do we have any questions from the board? Tardy, it looked like you wanted to say something. Charlie, are you trying to say something? No, ma'am. I just have to lean forward because of the bifocals. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Anyone else? Questions? Amy Ken Ulmer, I think the reason we're probably not having much comment is because our last meeting wasn't even a month ago. So 
most of these numbers haven't changed a whole lot. And I think we all had a lot of input the last time on each one of the uh, reports. I'm sure you're exactly right. I was going to attribute it to not enough coffee yet, but you are probably exactly right. Okay, well, thank you, um, Natalie. We appreciate you. And that will move us along to field inspections. Lance Carolyn. Good morning, uh, members. My name is Lance Carolyn. I'm the uh, North Region Manager for Field Inspections. Uh, as pretty much everyone has stated, uh, we have up until uh, July fiscal 2023 of our stats. But one thing I wanted to point out that was uh, asked on the last meeting was that bullet point right under the stats for FY 2023 as far as the uh, virtual inspections. We've conducted 10 of them through September 1st through July 31st. Any questions? How's that working out, virtual inspections? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good tool for us to have uh, when we need it. Okay. okay, board, any more questions on that? Okay, well, thank you, Lance. We appreciate your time today and your report. Thank you. All right. World famous Todd Forster, Compliance Division. Yes, good morning. Todd Forster with the Compliance Division, which is probably our biggest change since the last meeting. We are no longer the Regulatory Program Management Division. We have gone back to our roots and changed the name back to the Compliance Division. We felt it better reflected what we did, helping people come into compliance. It's a lot less words and a lot easier to say. Um, we are continuing with our training. We were supposed to have one. It's the second Wednesday of every month, so it would be today. Because of the meeting and other things, it got pushed back. We are going to have a, a bigger extended training in October. So anybody who would like to who would like to attend from the VSF tow industry, let me know. We can get you signed up for it. Um, other than that, everything is going as planned. Are there any questions? Any questions from our board? Okay. Thank you, Todd. That was short Thank and sweet. You. Okay. Now we get to hear from the executive office, Ms. Jessica Escobar. I look forward to this. Hi, everybody. Jessica Escobar, Chief of Staff again. Um, thank you for joining us again. Everybody said it. Very quick turnaround. Uh, one of the quickest I've seen <laughs> for board meetings and um, that it within my programs as well. So thanks for joining us again. I know this takes a lot of time from your schedules as well. Um, so you've just had an update from us last meeting from uh, Eric Beverly, who an update from from us is he's actually left us to go be the executive director at the Sunset Commission. So it's very exciting for him. Sad to see him go, but very exciting for him. Um, as far as that's concerned, I know he updated you that we just finished the legislative session. I mentioned the electric vehicle charging station bill. Um, we're very busy working on implementation of bills right now. So we have nearly 30 bill teams that are working on implementation on various items from administrative things like procurement and in information technology all the way to EV chargers. So, like I said, our, our biggest thing is taking input. And so we will be reaching out to you all soon as far as how we can incorporate things like safety from your end while we we focus on that for compliance from the industry's end. So that's what we're working on right now. The other big piece that we are working on is uh, the procurement of our licensing system. This was a humongous win for us during the legislative session, something we're really proud of. We got a very big appropriation to work on it. And, and once that's completed, it'll make things a lot easier for our licensees much more streamlined. It'll make us operate more efficiently and offer better, um, more efficient services for our, our licensees, customers, and the public. So you'll be able to do pretty much everything online, check in on your status, on your license from your computer without even having to call us. So we're very excited. It's going to be a, a a long process, but it'll be great once we get it completed. So those are the big things we have going on right now. Um, and we look forward to chatting with you again soon. So thank you. 
Thank you, Jessica. We appreciate that report. Board members, any questions for the executive office? Okay, thank you. We appreciate your time this morning. Thank you for joining us. All right, that moves us to agenda item G. We are going to call on Mr. Mark Gladney. We're going to discuss the recommendations of the proposed amendments to the existing rule, Texas Administration Code 16, Chapter 85.722, regarding the Vehicle Storage Facilities Program, pursuant to Occupations Code 2303.1552. The proposed amendments increase the allowable vehicle storage facility impound fee and the daily storage fees in accordance with the changes in the consumer price index during the preceding state fiscal biennium. Mr. Mark. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members. Uh, for the record, Mark Gladney, Assistant General Counsel in the TOL VSF program. Um, and I'm here to uh, present the proposed rule package. Uh, for uh, 85.722 uh, to implement the requirements uh, of the aforementioned statute 2303.1552. Now, this is something that we do every odd number year in keeping with that statute to set maximum daily storage and impoundment fees for the next two years. Uh, so, pursuant to that statute, the commission is authorized to adjust maximum vehicle impound and storage fees based upon changes in the consumer price index uh, in every odd number year. So in this rule package, we are again addressing two rule sections as we have in the past, 85.722D and E. Um, Anna, could you put those uh, share screen and put those uh, proposed rules up? Thank you. Okay, we, we were about to bring this to you uh, in the last meeting, but uh, after reviewing a, a public comment received shortly before the August 3rd meeting, uh, we pulled the proposed rule package to, to uh, uh, consider and, and make adjustments consistent with the applicable statute. So after staff reviewed uh, using the formula in the statute, uh, staff recalculated and made an adjustment, which increased the maximum VSF storage fee shown in the proposed rule 85.722D is in David, uh, which you see on your screen, uh, from $21.03 uh, to $22.85 for vehicles uh, 25 feet or less. And uh, Anna, if you could scroll up a little bit to the next page. And then we uh, increased uh, the vehicles over 25 feet from $36.80 maximum fee to 39.99 okay um now also in this proposed rule package if you could scroll up to um e on uh, there we go we also made an adjustment to the um impoundment maximum impoundment fee and that went up from 2103 to 22 dollars and 85 cents okay now while the statute generally notes that the rule package would be effective not later than um, November 1st of this year, due to the changes that we had to make, uh, we're expecting the commission to adopt the rule package uh, at, at their December 1st meeting. So the rules are likely to be effective uh, January 1st of 2024. Uh, we are certainly aware of the public comments associated with uh, this particular rule, especially the one Mr. Forbes gave. Uh, and, and we're cognizant of the, the fact that uh, the, the operators out there would like to get this effective as quickly as possible. So we are we are doing that uh, and, and we will move with, with all deliberate uh, speed. So uh, that's basically all I have on this particular rule package. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, uh, I, I will attempt to answer them as long as they're not math questions. Yeah, math is my kryptonite, so, you know, if you have a math question, yeah, I may have to turn it over to Tony, uh, our, our budget analyst. Uh, Ken Ulmer here. <clears throat> Do you have the number? So I'm I'm understanding that we took Mr. Forbes's concern into play, and the um, calculation issue was relooked at. Do you know what the difference was between before Mr. Forbes's issue was addressed and after? I think the the 
concern was, and, and from staff standpoint, you know, we we may have used a, a different a mathematical input from 2019 to 2021, but from staff's in, uh, standpoint, um, we we believed it to be acceptable uh, within the, the framework of the um, of the uh, the statute. Uh, but after after looking at the uh, the uh, uh, comment that was brought forward by Southwest Toe. Uh, we went back in, we took a, another look at it, and uh, it, it's an it's a, a way of look, another way of looking at the um, uh, how how to calculate these things. Uh, but as long as it's within the four corners of the statute, uh, which we determined that you know it, it it would be, what we're trying to do here is make sure that we're operating within the statute and making sure that the operators, the licensees, get the maximum amount of money. Uh, available to them that they can. I'm not sure that answered the question, but uh, um, that's kind of where we we are at, at this particular point. So let me <clears throat> let me phrase it a little differently. Um, we know that that calculation had already been done at our last meeting. Um, be, we didn't address it because TDLR wanted an opportunity to go back and look at it. So can you tell me what that number was at the last meeting? Or was it 2285? I'm trying to find out if uh, the concern brought by Mr. Forbes and Southwest Toe actually changed the daily rate um, calculation. If that calculation actually changed that number, it, 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 it did change the number. The, the previous calculation that we were going to pre present to you was about 40 cent, uh, 45 cents lower on the. Um, uh, on the, the daily storage fee for, for vehicles, uh, 25 feet or less. And uh, then the, the one for the, the vehicles over 25 feet, uh, there was a recalculation and it, it changed it by about 70 cents. So, okay, okay, thank you. That, that was really what I was trying to get to. Um, Cause I, I'm gonna tell you being in the vehicle storage facility business, I, I really feel for, for Mr. Forbes and everybody in this industry, we, we are, this is the biggest struggle our industry has ever seen. There are vehicle storage facilities that are going out of business. And I know this, I have talked to them, I've spoken to them and, and it's strictly, we just can't make the numbers work. Um, and so I know 45 cents doesn't sound like a lot, but 45 cents is a huge amount when you're talking about these guys who are relying on, on you know, pennies worth of profit. You know, we're, we're talking about an industry that has an average profit margin of less than 10%. So 45 cents is a huge deal. So thank you very much for taking into consideration. Thank you, Mr. Forbes, if you're still listening for bringing that forward. Thank you, Southwest Toe for, for you know, helping Mr. Forbes with that. Um, I really appreciate it. And I know there are a lot of small operators out there that I've talked to that this, I, I mean, they, they, are, they are truly struggling. Um, we, even as a large operator, are, are truly struggling because we have really had to change our operations to uh, remain in business. And um, I know a lot of people don't feel like vehicle storage facilities are, are an important business, but they certainly are when you start piling up the roadways and, and people can't get to where they want to go and milk can't get to the Walmart shelves. It becomes a huge issue. So thank you very much for that. And, and, and along those lines, I, I think I can probably speak for staff that, you know, we, we do realize that uh, um, you know, every every penny is important uh, to to the licensees, and uh, if we have an opportunity to, to act within the statute, when you know within the four corners of the statute, um, you know we would make every attempt to you know maximize uh, the amount of money that's available uh, to the uh, vehicle storage uh, facility operators. So um, we're, we're right there with you, you know. So. You know, we, we realize that and, and appreciate your concerns. And Mr. Gladney, let me be very, very clear. I am 100%. I am so proud of TDLR for acting on this as quickly as they did. Rescheduling a meeting less than a month later. Uh, you know, that to me, that is exactly what TDLR is supposed to do. I am extremely happy that you re-looked at those numbers once it was brought to your attention. Um, and I, I'm certainly not criticizing that the number wasn't right the first time, like you said, it's within a parameter. Um, so I, I really appreciate you acting that quickly. I appreciate you um, addressing that issue. And um, it, it, it happened faster than typically things do with governmental entities. So thank you very much for that.
Well, we had a number of people taking a, a, a good look at what was provided to us in that comment, and, and, and we moved out. Um, ha having said all that, uh, what uh, staff is asking for is a motion to uh, recommend publication of the proposed rule package as presented today. I make a motion to recommend publication for the rules package as published today. And I will second Amy Milstead. Thank you. I'll go ahead and do a, a roll call. Kyle Jackson. Aye. Tasha Mora. Aye. Gary Hoffman. Aye. Charles Rash. Aye. Ken Ulmer. Aye. Mark Mitchell. Aye. And presiding officer Amy Milstead. Aye. Motion passes. Right. And Ms. Milstead, one what just one more quick thing so that everybody who's watching this or goes back and watches this later, I want to make absolutely sure no one makes a mistake. This does not go into effect until Please restate that date if you would, so that everybody can make sure that they understand this is not something they can do right now. If if I can just jump in here, we've got a number of steps that need to happen. Uh, we are going to go to publication with the Texas Register. It will be open for public comment for 30 days. We will then collect the comments. We probably will not need to bring this back to the board because the rate is what the rate is. Uh, we've addressed the things that were raised in public comment. And in order for us to get this rule um, launched and effective as soon as possible, we most likely will not have the second presentation to the board, um, which means Mark will go to the commission as soon as practical after public comments come back and it's for the commission to formally adopt the new fees. And then there will be an effective date. So you are correct. There are a number of things that need to happen before these rates go into effect. And as Mark said, we will move as quickly as possible, but please understand some of this does depend on when the next board meeting is. There's one in October that will be during our public comment time. So we will not present it in October. We will do it as quickly as we can after public comment period ends. And I, I would also note that um, um, we expect to have the rule package sent to the Texas register within the next few weeks. Uh, and so it should be published either, you know, near the end of this month or early next month. And then as Elizabeth said, it's a 30 day comment period. Uh, we'll, we'll, we will examine whatever comments that we get back. Um, it is my understanding the next um, uh, a commission meeting for which this rule package would be eligible for my presentation would be December 1st. Um, assuming that the commission uh, adopts the the rule, uh, then uh, you know it, it still has to uh, go through some various processing, and the rule will most likely be a, uh, be effective probably January first at the latest of twenty twenty four. Thank you. Thank you. That's the kind of clarification I wanted so that people understood. Just you know. People, people look at this and they only get a portion of it. And I just didn't want someone to make a mistake and have a possible violation. Thanks. If I, may, I, I have a question. Tasha Mora has a question under the 85.722. And the question relates to um, under C for notification fee. Um, when does the notification fee go under review to see if that perhaps needs to be adjusted? Um, where in the rules is that that can give us some guidance on when the notification fee itself needs uh, to be um, studied as well, perhaps? Uh, in this particular uh, rule package, uh, obviously, we, we didn't uh, necessarily take that in, into account for this one, but we can certainly go back in 85, um, 722 and, uh, you know, not just review that particular uh, section if there's if there's an issue, but just review the entire um, the entire uh, section uh, as, as need be. So it's, it's something we can put on our calendar for for future uh, um, review and analysis. Okay, thank you, Mark. Would that be something that we can add to the agenda for the next meeting? If, if that's what you you want to do, we, we, 
I guess we could talk about it. But we, we don't really want to make any changes to the to, to the rules section right now because it's already open for you know this particular change. Um, so you know we can certainly discuss it at the next meeting, but it, it might be something that you know maybe we wait until after uh, this rule uh, the rule changes we're currently making in that section have been uh, uh, adopted and are now effective, then we reopen it again for possible uh, uh, additional changes. So if I can just jump in here, Elizabeth Solange, Street Manager, Assistant General Counsel, there is nothing in statute that allows us to reset the notification fee. So that would need to be a further discussion. Um, Todd is messaging me something. Todd, do you have something? Yeah, so what the, stat what the statute says is, let me get to it. Um, D or not D uh, B one. A rule may adjust in the impoundment fee under section twenty three hundred three point one five five B two and the storage fee under twenty three hundred three point one five five B three. It doesn't B two and B three are specific to the impoundment fee and the storage fees. Right. That that's the daily storage rate in the impoundment fee. So there's no statutory authority what what that means is there's no statutory authority to adjust the notification and, and we can look at it i just don't i don't off what i'm reading i don't see that i, I will definitely take a hard look at the statute to see okay. if our taking authority generally might get us there but i'm not i i'm not optimistic that it would but i will take a look at it okay thank you anything else on this topic from the board well, I definitely want to echo what Ken Ulmer said. Um, shout out to Trevor for his hard work on this. Southwest Tow Operators, um, you guys did an amazing job. And it just goes to show, those of you that are listening and, and all the board as well, the, the department is listening to your comments. They are listening to your concerns that you're bringing. So don't stop. Keep bringing them. And let's keep working together to make something happen for our industry. Thank you, Mark, for all your hard work on this. We appreciate it. Like Ken said, it may be 45 cents, but that does add up. And every little bit counts when you're counting pennies like we all are. Thank you for your report. We appreciate that. Thank you. OK, nothing else on that. That'll move us to agenda item H, discussion regarding the towing and storage of electric vehicles. Concerns from licensees reg uh, relating to the towing and storage of these types of vehicles after they have been involved in an accident and understanding the statutory requirements to tow and store these types of vehicles. We will call on Elizabeth Selena Strip Matter, Assistant General Counsel, to talk on this for us. Right. Well, my, my understanding based on our last meeting was that the industry wanted to help to educate TDLR on the challenges and the problems that face the industry on towing so that we could better understand how the electric vehicles are impacting your businesses and what supports you need you might need to have in place in the future to deal with the towing of this this particular type of vehicles um, and I, as we discussed last time uh, i believe it was mentioned you know about fees so as, as you've heard from our last discussion Fees are statutory in nature. So if the industry feels that it needs uh, additional fees to specifically address electric vehicles, that's gonna be a statutory change that you would work with your associations to pursue. Um, also, the statute does not make a distinction between an electric vehicle, and I'll just call them traditional vehicles, a gasoline or a diesel vehicle. So, you know, it, it is considered a vehicle, an electric vehicle, but there is no distinction in the different types of vehicles. So when we're talking about the towing of an electric vehicle, just understand that the framework is the tow statute as it currently reads. Um, we definitely want to hear about the challenges that you're facing um, so that we can have a better idea of what supports you're going to need in place as we move forward and as electric vehicles become more prevalent. I have read a little bit about the subject. Todd was very gracious to send me some material shortly after our first meeting. And I do understand there's a there's a significant risk of fire post tow and storage. I understand there's questions about what happens when you show up to an incident management tow and um, there are sparks and parts of the vehicle that are that are maybe firing or there may be small fires. Um, but I definitely would like to hear 
you know, really for me, if somebody could explain to us on a typical electric vehicle incident management tow, what would that look like when you show up and what are your concerns that go through your mind when you're called out to tow one of these vehicles? Elizabeth, are you asking for that right now or are you yeah. want to yeah. see it? Okay. Yeah. It's on the agenda, so we can, we can talk about it. Okay, board members, here's your chance. <clears throat> Gary Hoffman, uh, there are several issues and we are learning as we go as well. Many of the fire departments are learning as they go as things expand or more and more of these vehicles are on the road and on the scenes. We're not notified when we respond on a law enforcement tow in most cases that it's involving an electric vehicle until we get on scene and some of the drivers have had training on it. Not all drivers have had it yet. And again, that training is limited as the circumstances change. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a scary <laughs> environment for us, not knowing what we're getting into, not knowing the different levels and stages of uh, the damage occurred to a vehicle. Minor, minor damages, you don't treat much differently, but you never know if it hit any of those uh, vital parts that could cause start causing the thermal runaway. I haven't seen any scenarios where the vehicle has caught fire on a tow truck yet, but I know they're coming if they haven't already. Uh, sometimes it's noticeable at the scene as soon as you see it, like you mentioned, sparks uh, or something noticeable, so the, the vehicle smoking or something like that. Uh, but many times it's not noticeable. Many times it doesn't happen until later. Maybe some of the stories you've read a lot of these things, they're getting back to the storage facility and sitting there 10, 20, 30 days, or they're even moved to a salvage facility like a Copart or IA. And then 45, 60 days later, they're exploding. And those are the videos you're seeing with them catching on fire, burning down. So the scenarios with our employees, with the security of our vehicle storage facilities and the vehicles around them in the storage facilities, uh, as Mr. Grubbs mentioned, uh, energy security agency is providing a good service. We can call in at the scene of the accident and they're rating the vehicles uh, on level of uh, danger, I guess. I, I don't remember the terminology they use, but they grade it one, two, or three as uh, their level to what they believe the chances of it igniting or, or going into thermal runaway are. And then they recommend dropping if, if it can go in general population with the rest of your vehicles or if you need to uh, allow 50 feet around it or if you're going to have some kind of containment device in your vehicle storage facility. Uh, 50 feet around a vehicle in all four directions is very hard to do no matter how big you are. If you have a big place, if you have a little place, it's nearly impossible. Uh, but trying to and especially if you get more than one, if you, you're in a bigger city or you're around these college campuses with these kids driving electric vehicles, you might get two, three or four at a time. And once they're asking for 50 feet uh, radius around the car, it's nearly impossible. One of these containment devices that Mr. Grubbs is talking about that they've come out with are kind of a storage bin uh, that you're able to submerge the vehicle in. They are very costly. I have not purchased one. I know a couple of people that have purchased them and I've heard they're approximately $40,000 a piece for the containment device. And if you're storing that vehicle in that containment device for 20, whatever dollars a day, 2285, if we get there, uh, that's <laughs> gonna take a whole lot of that to pay for that $40,000 uh, uh, containment. Uh, <laughs> Whatever I'm trying to say there. Uh, that, that's just some of my tidbits on it. Ken, you may have more that you want to add or some of the other guys. I do have just a couple of things. They're all really good points, Gary. Um, another thing that we really have to be concerned about, if we use these water type of containment situations, that water that has in, been in that containment and that car has been submerged in, uh, number one becomes hazardous material because it's also inundated with this battery fluid and different things that are in these batteries that are hazardous. Um, and then um, number two, uh, it, it is no guarantee that it will 
keep it from catching on fire. The other thing that I'm very concerned about, and I've just been posed this question by an insurance agent, is um, they're talking about beginning to ask the question, are your vehicle storage facilities storing electric vehicles? And if so, what is your protocol for doing that? I foresee that getting to a situation where an insurance company could possibly prohibit a vehicle storage facility from even receiving these types of vehicles. And I think at that point in time, um, that's going to be a huge issue for local jurisdictions, police departments, cities, uh, towns. Um, if vehicle storage facilities have to just say, look, we can't take that. Uh, our insurance company has denied us the ability to take that because we don't have the capability to deal with it. So I think it, I think it's really going to be a huge issue. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to grapple with it. I, I truly don't. I don't, I don't think everyone, I think most first responder agencies are, are struggling with the exact same thing. I know HFD is, um, I'm a member of a team at Transtar that looks at this stuff and, um, uh, you know, that, that training is ongoing right now and they, they do not have a firm answer right now as to what to do uh, in these situations. They, they do not have a truly uh, so a solution that they're comfortable with. And that tells me a lot. So <clears throat> I, I do think this is a big issue. I just I, I don't know how we're going to grapple with it. I really don't. I, I think it's going to be something we're all going to have to put our heads together and come up with some solutions for. Um, but I certainly don't think we want ourselves in a position where vehicle storage facilities which are all typically uh, limited on space, are uh, denying uh, the entrance or access of uh, electric vehicles, because I think that's going to really create a problem for everybody. What's, what's a fire agency going to do or a police agency or a local jurisdiction going to do if, if their vehicle store silly can't take the vehicle? So anyway, th those are things that I think we need to talk about. I don't have any solutions. I wish I did. I wish I had some answers, but um, I, I think this problem is a lot probably even going to get more in depth as we talk about it and, and work through it. Thank you. Todd has something to say, and then Jessica had something to say. Yeah, one, one thing that I would like everybody to keep in mind is the weight of these vehicles. On a practical day-to-day -day level, with, with you towing the vehicles as a gross vehicle weight rating, uh, they are making the SUVs now. The, the electric vehicles are, are oftentimes much heavier. So make sure on a, uh, that the, the equipment you bring out there can can handle that weight. It it seems like a small part, but but you know that could be the difference between you stopping or not stopping. So just make sure that you understand the weight of that vehicle which should be on the inside door, um, and with the gross vehicle weight rating that you're able to, that you're able to tow it safely. Kind of to elaborate on what Todd's saying there as well, and and really can too. Uh, we don't want it to turn into a situation where when you get out on an incident management tow, uh, a law enforcement tow, if you get out there with a the vehicle that, that is unable to tow it because of the weight rating or the people just not being trained properly and they say, hey, I can't, can't tow it, and then you're just going to have vehicles sitting in the street or parking lot, wherever it is, uh, for the safety issues and, like Ken said, not being able to take it to the storage facility if it gets there. I have a question. Jessica says she, she can wait. We'll talk to our board members who have their hands raised in a minute, but I have a question. On an IM tow, um, when you all are on the rotation list and you're called out, and if you see that it's not a vehicle that you're comfortable towing, like an electric vehicle that might be sparking, do you have the ability to tell law enforcement, I'm not going to tow this vehicle? Or are there risks to you being taken off the rotation list if you do that? I'll answer this one. Amy Mills said, yes, if you decline the call, you are skipped, you lose your spot, and then it goes to the next person. So you're losing revenue if you don't tow that car. Okay. And Mark says he has a question as well. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Just uh, Mark Mitchell, just more of a comment, really. I, From an insurance perspective, I sat in on the uh, insurance roundtable and Brock Archer made a presentation uh, with ESA in regard to uh, electric vehicles and I asked him after the meeting is it is this possible to I just been through my first uh, TDLR meeting and I said could you pose this training if you would to to towers and body shops and he's they are doing that now and so I can certainly make that information available to the board if, if anyone is interested that would be wonderful and um, our Mark Gladney had has a question I think that ties into this 
You're yes, my question was, uh, has anyone on the board uh, seen a submergence unit? Because what I'm curious about is how is the battery submerged in, in that unit? Uh, is the battery somehow removed from the vehicle and then deposited in the unit? I mean, the entire, the entire vehicle submerged, in, Mark. Well, the, the entire yeah. vehicle? Yeah, yeah the, the the unit that I'm referring to uh, that they had at the tow conventions this past year uh, is a 20 foot container. It looks similar mm -hmm. to a Connex box, but the top is open or like a roll off dumpster almost is what it looks like. One end folds down with a ramp on it and they've uh, got some kind of substance that they've made almost like a concrete layer on the floor, the walls and everything else. It's a thin layer of some material that's not supposed to burn. Uh, it has a winch inside of it, if it, so you could unload it on the ground and then pull it up into the device. You close the ramp, seal it off, and then there's hose attachments on each end of the container. And you leave it in there. You let your fire department know that the vehicle is there and it's in there. And if something goes wrong. They can uh, attach a fire hose to it. They can come out in fire truck, attach a fire hose to it, and within five minutes have it submerged up above the windows of the car. And so once it covers that battery over the floor of the car, that's the main part that has to be submerged to put the fire out. And so then I guess it soaks and just sits there. But then, as Ken mentioned, then you have all those hazardous materials from the battery that are in that water, and you've got to dispose of the water in the car. That was my question. Are there are there entities now that are offering that kind of service to come and siphon out that contaminated material and take it and dispose of it pursuant to probably EPA and TCEQ regulations? I'm sure the environmental companies are working on it, but I don't know of any specifically that are doing okay. it. But I, I mean, I'm sure they're kind of like us. They're all <laughs> trying to scramble and figure it out and, and doing yeah. what they can with it. Charlie, you've been <clears throat> so patient so much with us. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say maybe we could start by trying to get one of these companies that uh, or one of the agencies that, that uh, had started talking about this to maybe create a CE for our IM towers and make it a requirement of all IM towers to take a class. I mean, we take classes and usually every class is really similar, but this is something that's that's new and that that would be pretty interesting for drivers to 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 get some information about. Yes, and that 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 actually was was a wonderful idea, Charlie, because there is some wiggle room, I think, within the rules in relation to CE that would allow to make some requirements surrounding safety training for this. So uh, we do have a rules committee. I think that that would be as we move through this conversation, that would definitely be something that we can look into and see if we could get the CE. Of course, my caveat would be. We've got to make sure that when we make, if we can make that change to the rule, when we make that change in the, to the rule, that that type of CE is widely available to everyone across the state because so many of our licensees are rural, and you know we have to make sure that we're being equitable when we mandate a a CE, a particular CE. But I like that idea very much. I think that that is in, that is one of the things that we could do within our existing statutory and rule framework that might help to add a level of some level of comfort to the industry um, that at least people are being trained and the public because i mean if you're in a crash scene the public's not always aware that they should move away from the vehicle i mean the tow truck operators a lot of times here in houston is the first one there so sometimes we have to tell the people hey you know go sit on the curb or or get away from the car if the car's damaged bad enough they just don't realize you know they're kind of uh disoriented right after the crash and they don't realize they're in danger. So it would be helpful for not only us, but for the public also. Yes. And so one thing to, to stress, Todd, I was going to say this and Todd just sent me a message. The, the mandatory nature, if, if we were able to do it in rule, it only exists on the tow side, right? Cause there's no CE for VSX. Right. So that, that's sort of your rub there. Um, but you most, would kind of have to depend on industry compliance on their own to do that kind of training. 
because there is nothing in our in the statute that requires VSFC. Right, but I think most uh, VSFs on tow trucks, you know, they're they're definitely going to have some cross training. If it's required by the tow trucks, it'll the the VSF will get the information, and we don't know what to do. I mean, I've had lot fires on on gas cars with just damaged components that. Believe it or not, the wind blows and catches the car on fire, and then it burns up twenty cars. It happened to me last year. I mean, it's definitely, a, definitely an issue that we're going to have to address sooner or later. Go ahead, Tasha. Um, I know that that is uh, one of the areas that the industry and licensees tend to kind of get into. Is um, Many times the general public or even decision makers are grouping a tow licensee and a VSF licensee as one. So, yes, we're talking about where there's a lot of discussion about the towing of the vehicle, but also the storage. And so you can have they are two separate companies and you can have one and not the other. So then we talk about we do tap into now, VSF facilities would need additional training, perhaps. And some of us are, are, are licensees are being proactive and going out and trying to get that training. Um, but then there's that associated cost. And so we're, it's just amplified by that. Um, I wanted to circle back around um, to Mark, Mark Gladney. I think that um, you made a really good point. Um, before I had attended some of the training myself, um, I heard car battery, I heard electric vehicle battery, and I really was thinking like the traditional battery or maybe five of them, perhaps. It was during the training when I learned that in some electric vehicles, and I'm not a, a technician, automotive technician, but the whole bottom of an electric vehicle is the battery. And so um, being able to understand that that's part of why they're suggesting that the vehicles are submerged and it's not extracting the battery out, it's submerging the entire battery. But then I think the other topic that we haven't discussed is what do vehicle storage facilities do when it's time to dispose of the vehicle? You know, are there, is there gonna be a market for this? But right now from the literature that I'm reading, I'm seeing that these batteries are just, there's not quite yet, um, a streamlined way for a VSF um, licensee to easily dispose if we start getting a higher volume of these. So we need to consider that. And then also, lastly, the last point I wanted to make is um, for us to have uh, be mindful that um, the vehicle does not have to visually seem like it's been damaged. There can be damage that's occurring that's triggering the thermal runaway, and it doesn't appear that it's that. And some of these collisions perhaps would happen on public roadway, but some could happen in private property parking lots. So it, it, it's not so much only IMs, it's the consent drivers that may go out to a parking lot and pick up an EV vehicle. It's just, there's so many topics to consider um, that um, I, I'm glad that we're having this discussion. And, and like Gary said, we're, we're all learning as fast as we can you know, with, with all the different um, concerns that arise from the EV vehicles or servicing these EV vehicles. Elizabeth, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, three years, still muting. Uh, I wanna give Jessica an opportunity to jump in because she's been patiently waiting. Oh, it's all good. It's been great conversation and um, very helpful. So, and the reason I keep jump, Jessica Escobar, Chief of Staff. The reason I keep jumping in is um, I'm I'm I've been heavily involved in the um, electric vehicle conversation for the last two legislative sessions, and of course the bill just passed. So I am um, working with Chris Russi, our manager for compliance, who's who works closely with Todd and works. Um, He's going to be working with the EV program, and so right now we're trying to figure out where it's going to fit into our compliance division. And right now it's just an animal of its own. So we're working on implementation. Um, like I said earlier, the bill doesn't fully envision where you all fit. I think for these purposes, these are specific issues to tow and BSF. And so while we're adopting rules that are related to 
the regulation of the electric vehicle charging stations themselves, you all are going to have a whole set of issues that you need to work through. And I think Elizabeth and Mark can guide you on those through a um, directed work group to address those and see what you all need to do for safety issues. And depending on what you identify and Mark and Elizabeth are able to um, provide you guidance and taught as far as statutory and rule authority, you may be adopting rules that say, okay, or guidance on this is what you should be doing um, or adding a, an option for a continuing education course that'll meet the requirements for, for your tow licensees. Um, but we do want to take the input as we work on on the EV charging. So, like I said, we have our component, but as part of the component for the statute, the EV chargers are going to be or they are regulated through um, National Electrical Code, but also NFPA, the NIST standards. So there's multiple components and we know that we're not going to you know, be the experts on all of it, certainly not at the beginning and not at the end. So right now we have a work group that we're working to establish. It's a nine member work group um, and we have industry members, but we also have a public spot. And so those applications are being accepted through October 1, and then we'll start hopefully drafting rules or meeting to work on rules in January, February. We're going to be inviting ad hoc members, and you all certainly be an important part of the conversation. These are things where, while we knew we're on the radar, we didn't know to what extent, right? And so we've been talking with some of these manufacturers to not be named, and, and they have offered, um, you know, in part of these conversations, conversations, they have offered some trainings or insight to be able to meet with our licensees and meet with our staff and show them how to do safe toes, how to do these things. Um, and those are things that you all might want to avail yourself to to your staff, you know, and, and those are things that are, are great options as we learn um, what there is out there. And certainly now, as we saw over the summer, these connections between um, Tesla now working with Ford and Volvo and all this, you're going to see even more EVs out there on top of them saying we're going to go completely electric by 2035 or whatever. Now it's expanding. So we're anticipating seeing a lot more out there really, really quickly. So that was a lot, not even related to you all, but you guys are being dragged into it along with us. So um, I anticipate that we'll be seeing you guys for a work group. I'm sure that Chris and I will be popping in to learn more about that. And then we'll be grabbing you guys into our work groups over the next year. And Jessica, if, if anyone on the board or anyone who's watching would like to apply for that public spot. Absolutely. They so go? they can go um, to apply for that public spot. You would just go onto our TDLR webpage. We do have a webpage now for electric vehicle charging stations, and there is a spot for advisory boards and you can um, apply for for the work group, just as you would for, you know, your own fill out that application um, and please apply as a public member. Um, and and that's where you would go. It'd be a great resource if you do want to apply. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Elizabeth. Todd, you have you took your hand down, but did you still want to comment? Yeah, because um, kind of along what Tasha was saying about the you think about a car battery, you think about a car battery um, from it's my understanding that it, it's not as simple with these as disconnecting a battery because all the batteries are connected to each battery. So it's several connections that you can't, and obviously if it's on fire, you don't want to get down there and disconnect it because it's on fire. But it's not as simple as just disconnecting the battery. There's a lot more to it. And especially in areas like Houston, if there's a hurricane, the hurricane in Florida caused uh, uh, you know a lot of fires, car fires, because those vehicles were sitting in that salty water. So there are, there, it is an emerging thing that I think will be more of a problem, more of an issue for y'all. And, you know, any help y'all can give us in better understanding this, I, I can do the research. I don't, I like doing the research. I don't mind it, but I am not an electrical engineer. Um, and so any help y'all can give us is greatly appreciated. Mark, glad to. Uh, yeah, I mean, th this is, is a great discussion because um, back when uh, at the last meeting, when one of the board members brought it up uh, after the meeting, I think a few of us were actually having a debate about uh, this particular uh, subject. And there's been a lot of great discussion uh, today about, you know, 
um, all the ramifications and the education uh, issues that are associated with it. Yeah, you know, I still kind of go back to um, uh, this this submergence unit. And one of my concerns is, and I, and I have an electric car. I, I bought one um, late last year. I have a Volkswagen ID4. And and Ms. Moore is correct. You are sitting on a sheet of batteries. And even when you charge that vehicle, I have, I have a charger in my garage. Um, last week I charged it. I think it was like 103 degrees outside. Uh, and I had my garage partially open because you know, it gets a little warm in, in, in the garage. But when I was charging the vehicle, and I shouldn't have charged it during the day, and it was my mistake, um, I had a thermometer in there, and the garage actually increased to 122 degrees during the charge. Yeah. So, you know, these these batteries, I mean, they, they really do kick out uh, some heat, um, you know, even in the best of circumstances. But what my concern is, you know, some of these vehicles are pretty expensive. And when you put them in a submergence unit, uh, let's just say it's minor damage um, to the, the vehicle. But, you know, again, of course, you can't tell how that's affecting uh, the internal battery. But would that not necessarily degrade or, or, or damage other systems to the point where if it was a, a um, you know, say a fender bender that might cost maybe six or seven thousand dollars to the fix. Um, but once you put in the submergence unit, you know, other other systems are being affected by the water and you make it to a point where something that could have been fixed at six or seven thousand dollars is now maybe a total loss from the insurance company standpoint. Um, so I was just kind of wondering about what's the criterion going to be. I don't know if it's been developed or, or not yet as to when uh, these vehicles need to be put into a submergence unit or is that going to be standard practice? You know, again, these are all questions I think that, you know, people are probably talking about. Maybe there haven't been any decisions made, but uh, it, it just could kind of increase uh, some of the concerns that insurance companies might have uh, in maybe totally not vehicle, electric vehicles, when they may not be in a situation where they need to. So I think that leads to a, a great point where um, I asked the question to the chair, would you like to appoint a work group? from your board um, to work with us on exploring these issues and trying to figure out where, where we as an industry go from here. Absolutely. I don't even have to really chime in because I'm over here shaking my head. Everybody's touching on everything that I had on my list. We can't afford not to develop a work group and explore this. I mean, society's headed in that direction and it's gonna get more and more. Yes, we need a work group. And just to throw in there right now, we're just talking about light duty vehicles. They're already starting to have electric heavy duty trucks with Amazon and Pepsi. And some of these people are already operating these heavy duty trucks with that are fully electric as well. And that's going to create an even bigger issue. <laughs> so. Good well, and you hit on something, Gary, these larger vehicles like the Amazon and the big trucks, they have five batteries, not just one. They have five. So think about that. I mean, it just gets more and more complex. Absolutely. Okay. Well, um, so if you would like to, if you would like to pose a question to the floor, if anybody would, we'd need to do it through a motion, um, and then perhaps ask for volunteers, or you can appoint. Who you like. Okay. So I propose that we develop a work group. Do I need a motion to do that? Yes. Okay. Ken I'll Ulmer Josh makes a motion. Go ahead, Ken. Ken Ulmer makes a motion to. Uh, prepare to uh, point a, to ask for volunteers for that work group. I'll second Gary Hoffman. Okay. All right, so do we have any volunteers on the board that would like to get involved? I'm let's go ahead and do a vote for the motion. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's okay. I know y'all are excited. <laughs> Al Jackson. Did we lose we Mr. Jackson? We might have lost him. I think so. Okay. Uh, Tasha Mora. Aye. Gary Hoffman. Aye. Charles Rush. Aye. Ken Ulmer. Aye. Mark Mitchell. Aye. And Amy Milstead. Aye. Motion passes. 
Okay. Now I'd like to ask for volunteers from the board that can be involved in this work group. I'm going to be out because this is my last meeting. So you guys got to oh, take come it. on now, Amy. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll volunteer. Amy, uh, Charlie Rash, I'll volunteer. Okay, two. That's Gary Hoffman, Charles Rash. Anybody Mark else? Mitchell, volunteer. Mark Mitchell. That's and great, Mark. Tasha I'm going to see you on there. Natasha Mora. We're just going to sign the whole board up. <laughs> Okay, I think that's a good work group to start with. I think that will get us going. Elizabeth, you feel good with that? Yes, and that keeps us under quorum. So we're good um, with that work group. I, I'm very happy, Mark, you, Mark Mitchell, you volunteered because I really think that insurance can provide some what that thinking is happening over there. That will be a great um, that will be a great way for these two industries to talk together to find try to find some solutions. So I think all of I thank all of you, all of you who volunteered are phenomenal. We always appreciate your participation. And so um, what I will do with the work group is what I normally do. Um, we'll set up an initial meeting. Um, in this particular work group I will probably be one of those really long term ones where we're talking about various things, doing research. Um, but my immediate thing uh, for me is to go and look at how we could, if we could get some rules addressing EVs under the current statute, and if so, what it might look like. So um, then while you all are, um, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting a bunch of messages this morning. This week's been relatively quiet, but once I get into a meeting, everybody, everybody wants to talk to me. So, uh, so once we, I think, have a good idea of what we can do in rule, I think that's going to help to shape sort of where the work goes from there. So uh, I will be reaching out soon to y'all to set that up, um, inviting exec if they would like to attend, and also Chris Russi, the manager of compliance. They will be involved in these conversations as well. Um, and then we will move forward. And at a certain point, we'll do a report back to the board on the things that we're working on, the things that we're talking about, so that we're transparent in what's happening on the work group but we are cognizant of your time it's not like we're going to have a work group meeting every week you know they'll be spaced out uh, and probably run in conjunction with our schedule for our board meetings so we can have a work group meeting and then we would have a board meeting so we can update on if there's an update out of that work group uh, so i think um, that wraps up our discussion uh, amy on this particular subject one more quick question. One more quick question, Elizabeth. Like in yes. in these work groups, does it have to remain just us as the advisory board, or can we bring in some of these outside agencies that are no. to discuss it's, what's it's, going on with it? it? Has to be just the advisory board. It's just the advisory okay. board, and then okay. of course, when we get into the work groups, I will remind everybody about forums and walking forums, yeah. and all of that okay. stuff. But so. yeah, right now it is just going to be y'all as representatives of the industry. Um, okay. But you are free to talk to fellow licensees, non-board member fellow licensees, and get information to bring to the meeting. Sure. Um, okay. It's the way they can participate. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. I just want to chime in. Um, obviously, everyone sitting here on the board understands how critical this is and how, how we've got to devote some attention and, and work on this. Those that are listening out in the industry, we need input. If you have any input, reach out to these work group members and send them information, give them contacts, because we are going to need all the education we can get on this. So it, it's not only for the industry as a whole of what we're doing out there, it's also for protection, protection of the consumer, protection of your employees, all of that. So again, I cannot urge you enough to educate us, give us any information that you have. Okay, does that wrap up that agenda item? We're good, no one else? Okay, thank you all for your input on that. You said everything that I had written down, so thank you. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to agenda item I. We're going to discuss the tow hearing pursuant to Texas Occupations Code 2308.452 through 2308.458. And we're going to go right back to Elizabeth Salinas Strip Matter, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so at the last board meeting, Tasha asked for this to be placed on the agenda. I'm, I'm not quite sure what questions she might have had, so I think I'd like to start now that it's on the agenda and we can talk about it by seeing what her concern is. Um, 
What we are talking about is, as Amy said, chapter 2308, 452 through 458 or 59, um, that sets out the right of a consumer to go to a JP court and request a hearing on the legality of the tow. And when we say legality of the tow, that relates to was it a tow in compliance uh, with with a proper tow under Texas law. And so for those out there who are watching, the tow hearing is initiated by a consumer. TDLR can also do an investigation into an alleged bad tow, but those two things don't necessarily collide together. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So, um, Mr. Lewis is gonna be contacted by enforcement to talk about his case that he brought up during public comment. Um, and so for now, I think, why don't we go ahead and have Tasha explain what her concerns are and then see how we can address them. Thank you, Elizabeth. So my, my question would be, um, if we could receive perhaps further clarification of who is entitled to a hearing. So in 2308.452, Mm -hmm. uh, under the right of the owner or operator of the vehicle to a hearing, the there's language that says explicitly the operator of the vehicle is entitled to a hearing. Um, and of course, the language carries on. Um, the, the concern and the pattern that I've seen happen more than twice, um, it, it wasn't just an off set thing, is um, licensees, um, a appearing for a non-consent tow hearing. However, the person who is filed for the hearing may be the vehicle owner, however, um, was not the person who paid the tow and storage fees to for the release of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But um, the JP judges so far are reading uh, um, the rules and the rules do say that the vehicle owner is entitled to a hearing. Um, and when you move further into the rules, um, one of the roles is to get a reimbursement of the fees paid for the vehicle towing and storage of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, as written, I can understand how one could interpret that one could be a vehicle owner, not have paid the fees to the vehicle storage facility, still be entitled to take a vehicle storage facility or towing company to a non-consent tow hearing and be able to claim funds and fees that were never paid by the person who filed. And, and so I, I have just read through this over and over and I, I can see how um, I can see a perspective is as written. Um, the rule does speak to, who's entitled and a vehicle owner, but I don't see that it speaks to the payor that's paid the fees. That That's a person who would be granted the refund or the overpayment. It does not speak to it. Natalie, have you all seen this in enforcement? I've come across one uh, case. It wasn't necessarily involving a tow hearing. Uh, but it was one time that I requested a refund um, and that tow company uh, or the storage facility did let me know who was the person that paid because they still had the records and they were fine with issuing the refund to the person that paid. And, you know, which we had no problem with. So if it is something like that situation, um, you know, in we have, you know, who the vehicle owner is and we're requesting the refund to the vehicle owner. Again, you can just let us know, you know, this was the person that paid. We have no problem giving a refund to that person. And, you know, or, you know, if you have already given a refund, let's just say um, to whoever paid, but then, you know, we don't know about that yet. And we're asking, you know, or inquiring about, um, about refunds or, or anything about this case. You can just let us know that you already have processed a refund for whoever the payor was. And of course we do take that into account. We're not trying to, you know, collect any extra fees. Um, 
or make you pay any refunds, you know, that, that were not, um, you know, are not due. I, and, and Natalie, I, I, I 100% agree. And I can see in that type of scenario, the scenarios that I'm seeing and I've had some experience with also is the, this has is only at the non-consent level. So TDLR is not involved at the moment. There's no complaint yet. Um, this is being able to point to the rules um, and, and judges are pulling the rules up because it's, it's, it's very clear in the non-consent tow hearing applications and it specifies the rules. So judges will pull the rules up and read. And it's been more than two judges that as reading the rules as is, have stated that as written, the vehicle owner is entitled to the tow hearing. Makes sense. That's how it's written. But there's nothing to specify that I can see in the rules or so far those two judges are seeing in the rules that says um, that it would, the refund goes to the payor. So for business practices, for example, there's absolute no record of a financial transaction between the person who is um, taking a tow company to a non-consent tow hearing and perhaps awarded a, the, the fees. And so I, I wanted us to look at the rules as written so that it protects the licensees because um, this, this can, it could open the door for more. And I just, it is, um, it's, it's a difficult place for a licensee to be in is to have never conducted business what, with an individual, never collected funds from an individual, but be required to refund or issue funds to this person. So if I could just jump in here. You keep making reference to rule, but I, oh, sorry. What, what rule are you talking about? So, I, and pardon me for the language. So, in 2308, statute. The statute, yes. Sorry. And, I, and it's the statute. Thank you for the correction. You're right. I appreciate that. So, every, every area where I said rule replaced with statute. Okay. Um, and that's what I'm referencing the statute. And and the in the non-consent in in the place of the non the space of the non-consent tow hearings, the statutes are referred to, and they're referred to by vehicle owners. They're referred to the towing company. They're referred by storage facilities. But ultimately, they're also referred to um, by the judges. So the judges are reading these, and um and there's so I just wanted I think it's time to take a look at that so that. We don't have a situation where there's um, businesses are being required to issue funds to an individual who's never conducted a financial transaction with the business. So, so we have no authority to tell a JP court what to do. The statute right. applies to TDLR. TDLR, uh, the, the statute allows for this hearing and for the appeal of the hearing to take place. If the JP right. is ordering payment be made to Natalie Olvera, but Natalie didn't pay to get that car released, Elizabeth did, then that is the JP. That's not us. So I, I don't really know what to say other than we have no jurisdiction um, to do anything to the JP court. If, if the court issues an order to your company to pay uh, Natalie, then you should follow that order. Um, I can't provide you with legal advice other than to say this is an argument that should be made at the hearing of who the correct payee is. You're right. Is there is there is it within TDLR's allowance to go into the statute and where um, the statute reads the court may the court may award and it itemizes what the court may award mm -hmm. but specify to who that perhaps we just need that language in there that would be something that would need to take place at the legislative level so again that would be something um, we can put on our internal tdlr list for possible proposals for strategic planning but that's definitely an issue um, 
that you all should work on or can work on outside of TDLR because um, not all of our scrap plan topics, uh, we all, all of our programs put in all these topics that need to be addressed in all of our statutes and lucky few make it. Uh, those are the things that are picked up by the legislature. But the more people who are trying to raise a particular concern helps when you're trying to catch the legislature's attention. So, um, yeah, I wish I could tell you that TDLR could tell the JP court, we can't tell them anything. We have no jurisdiction to tell them anything. The court is their jurisdiction. And if they decide they're going to issue an order to a pay to a person who is different than the payor, then that's an issue that's outside of TDLR. Ken? Yeah, uh, Tasha, you're, you're very uh, intact with things that are happening in the industry. So you may have uh, identified an issue that uh, could be abused, and I certainly don't want to overlook it. I will say, though, just to add a little bit to the discussion, every tow hearing I've been involved in, and I've been involved with them on the towing side and on the uh, VSF side as rep representation on both, they have required uh, in our tow hearings that the person present a receipt for the fees that they actually paid. And um, I have never seen one where they did not present that in order to uh, initiate the tow hearing. Now, that doesn't mean that they specifically paid those fees. It just means that they have the receipt. But the second part of that, every tow hearing I have ever reimbursed, um, and there have been a few, sometimes we make mistakes, uh, has been an order from the judge as to specifically who that pay would be to. So it would name the person. Um, and I, I totally see where this could be something that could be abused, but everyone that I've addressed so far has been that type of a situation. Um, and I feel like, uh, I feel like this is definitely something that we probably need to be thinking about in case it becomes, uh, an, ab an abusive situation. Obviously it has to some degree because you've seen two cases where it has, but so far I have not seen that. Um, uh, the other thing that I want to point out is as a tower and a VSF, you have the opportunity to present information at that hearing. And um, it is, I, I, I would be the very first one saying, hey, this person is not the person who paid, or um, this is not the registered owner of the vehicle that uh, actually retrieve the vehicle. I, I would make a point of that myself. Now, sometimes the way the tow hearings are set up in Harris County, we don't get to respond um, simply because they are so spread out and we have to actually appeal. And then on the appeal process, we will get an answer, uh, an opportunity to answer because they spread those out. Sometimes it's 50 miles in between two tow hearing locations. Um, so that that is sometimes a problem. Um, the other thing is, that uh, I had one more point that I wanted to make and, and it totally just slipped my mind. Um, yeah, I, it has totally slipped my mind what that other point was. But anyway, I definitely is not something I want to overlook because it, it could be an abusive issue, but uh, I haven't seen that so far. Um, and I, I, I have seen judges take way too much liberty in in those tow hearings but that's generally we appeal when that happens um so i don't know maybe there's some more input that i'm missing tasha if there is no i can i can appreciate it and you're right all, all the suggestions um and i and i'm i say this to also any of the other licensees that may be watching and listening as well is can you make really valid points? And I'm in agreement. And 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 many, those are the the practices. Those are the practices. To say he's here's a payor. Here's a person who claimed the vehicle. Um, and so it just it 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 makes it difficult when you can see that this could be abused. A one off is a one off, but it's when it's there's m multiple. Then then there's concern and. And if perhaps that's, if there's any other licensees that have ever experienced something like that, I think that it's worthwhile to, to explore it. Um, I do know that, you know, the two entities of the way they operate are, are, are separate and I can appreciate that. Um, but that is definitely a concern of, of 
referring to the statute, seeing that a vehicle owner is entitled, but it doesn't state the vehicle owner who paid for or operator who paid for the charges. And my ask would be, is it possible for the statute to have language that inclu is inclusive of that, that it specifies? If, if I could interject, Ken Ulmer, I do remember now what I was trying to say. Uh, one of the things that has come up in uh, some of my other roles, um, one of them being the uh, chairman of the City of Houston Automotive Board, the definition of vehicle owner as taken from the Department of Motor Vehicles is a lot larger than you and I both um, are sometimes comfortable with, and it's also larger than what we would consider normal terms. In other words, it's not necessarily the person who bought and paid for the vehicle. Sometimes um, it may be a person who is, you know, in care, custody and control sort of, um, which is kind of where our insurance rule came from, where if they have insurance on that vehicle, they're allowed to pick it up. Um, I don't know that. I, I'm certainly not saying that I always agree with that because I don't sometimes, but that is sometimes that definition from the Department of Motor Vehicles. It's not a, a very short definition. It's very long and it, it includes a lot of different um, scenarios for who may be considered that vehicle owner. So there again, the opportunity for that towing company or vehicle storage facility to interject at that tow hearing would be a, a good good place to go on that. I just. I think we need to think about where those changes need to be made. I do think they have to be made in statute, but I think we need to give some consideration as to where they need to be made those changes. So I'd definitely be involved in, you know, helping with that. Right, but just to stress, this is a statutory change. So right now, there's nothing that TDLR can do to further address the issue. Um, I can put it on the list for strap planning, happy to do that, but outside of that, as Ken noted, uh, you can always appeal your tow hearings. I don't know if there is a, if there actually would be standing to appeal an order to pay person A who did not actually pay the fees. I don't know. And I can't give that legal advice even if I knew. Um, but that's really something to talk to your attorneys about. If you have questions about how this statute is being interpreted, that's something that you need to talk with your legal counsel about. And Elizabeth, this is Natalie Olvera again with enforcement. I just want to add again, if something weird comes up in a case that we have, please, please work with us and let us know because we're not going to know unless you tell us. Because um, usually, you know, when we get complaints, that's what, you know, we're basing our information on. And, you know, if the tow company or VSF company is not responding to us, that's all we have to go on. So, Please, please let us know, um, you know, and respond to, you know, the investigators when they ask questions or prosecutor emails or ask questions. Again, just please work with us um, so we do have both sides, uh, you know, of the story and information. And, and, and to tag on to that, if you're involved in an enforcement, TDLR enforcement case where there is repayment at issue, um, you should really make sure you're making it clear with that enforcement prosecutor who you think the appropriate payee is. That's what Natalie is saying about making sure you're communicating, making making them aware of who who really should get the money, who was the person that paid that deserves um, the reimbursement. Okay. Any more discussion on this from the board? All right, good comments, Elizabeth. Thank you for keeping us on track and letting us know directly where we need to go to address the issues. Okay, nothing else on the agenda for discussion for that. That moves us to recommendations for agenda items for the next board meeting. Um, EV work group, Elizabeth, do you think it's too soon for them to report at that meeting? It might not be. I, I do think that we need to um, give some time, appropriate length of time. Um, normally, our meetings are not so closely together, um, so it really is going to depend on when the, when the target for the next meeting is going to be, and that's really a question for Anna. Um, normally, we try to have meetings to give updates of this type when there's rules that are on deck that are being considered. Um, we don't have any rules.
tools that would be on deck after the VSF setting be rolled, but there will be some, I, I, I think, um, in probably the spring of next year. Um, there's nothing in statute that requires you to meet every six weeks, every eight weeks, every 90 days. Um, so what normally I would suggest is that um, you all throw out what you would like to discuss at the next meeting. We can at least get that on board. And then as far as the, next, the timing of the next meeting, um, maybe we postpone that discussion on timing until we are clearer on sort of what the schedule is for for this board to meet. Um, and it gives me some time to work with our work group to see what time they might need to do some research, to talk to some folks, uh, and then report back to me. So I would suggest, and you don't have to go with me on this, but I would suggest that we, we schedule, a, we look at a meeting no sooner than January, February of 2024. Okay. Well, Elizabeth, could I ask a question? If Absolutely. if we, and I think Mark may have answered this. If if that um, rate adjustment goes through and it's approved by uh, TDLR um, mm -hmm. outside of us, do we have to have another meeting to actually put that into effect? We do not. Okay, I just wanted to make no, sure that, that was the case. So so you all, I don't, you might or might not remember from the training that I did last time on health rules. I had that whole on how the rules flow. The APA allows for us to have a second meeting after the first meeting where we propose the rule. And that usually, that second meeting, is to come back and address public comment. In cases like this, where the rule formulation is given in statute, there's really no comments that can be made that would change the drafting of the, of the rule as it existed in public comment. We would opt to skip that second meeting and go straight to the commission, particularly when the industry wants to get the effective date of the rule as soon as possible. So normally you would like to have a second meeting to talk about public comment, but in situations where something is just in statute and that's what it is, there probably is no real reason to have the second meeting. So to answer your question in a short way, no, we don't have to have the second meeting before Mark goes to the commission to ask for adoption. Great, thank you. I do have one agenda item that I would like to, and I, I, I probably am going to need some help from you, Elizabeth, in the wording of this. Um, I and I, I don't <laughs> take this that I'm trying to beat this issue to death again, because I know we've talked about the ZSF 12 form uh, to a great extent, but there is a caveat of the ZSF 12 form that involves insurance companies that I think needs to be discussed at a meeting and without it on the agenda, we can't open that discussion. So um, how, how would I word that so that we could discuss um, uh, consumer issues related to the VSF-12? You would need to specifically state what those consumer issues are. Okay, so I don't have a problem with that at all. I just didn't know how far I could go without overstepping any bounds. Um, consumer issues related to complaints uh, about insurance companies. Um, I'm going to use the word misuse of the VSF 12. If I need to be more specific, my more specificness is where does that consumer complain to? Because we, we have a situation where that consumer has no place to complain to. Todd was actually involved in this conversation as well. Um, okay. A Forrester. So, so I have no problem putting that on the agenda, but I just like to, for years, I have been telling people to call TDI. So TDI handles insurance complaints. TDI would be the entity that, that consumers complain to. We've, beaten that dead horse, I thought. So TDI is the correct entity to go to if a consumer has a complaint. If you want it on the agenda, we can put it on the agenda, but I think it's I think it's it's a it's misleading to say there's no place for consumers to go because there is. That TDI I told this consumer that that was a TDLR issue because it was a TDLR form. Well, if the issue is about misuse of the form which would which would constitute fraud, that's a TDI issue. 
because TDI regulates the insurance industry. We don't. So if, if there were allegations that an insurance adjuster did something improper on a Form 12 that could be considered fraud or another crime, we don't have any jurisdictional authority over that insurance adjuster, so we would not be the correct person to talk to. If there's a problem with the form that is that it has some loophole that we aren't aware of that is allowing people to kind of on the slide do stuff, that would be a TDLR issue. But the complaint from the consumer about the insurance company or the insurance adjuster, that is a TDI issue. I was I I didn't want to overstep any bounds, so I didn't want to get even more specific. But I let me let me go there, and if I'm I'm going down a path that I can't stop me, um, and I and I think it's probably a path that I can't. But this consumer uh, reached out to TDI, had no uh, wasn't able to get any resolution. Reached out to TDLR. The complaint was taken at TDLR, even though it was about the form and the insurance company picking up their vehicle. And now the complaint is lodged against the VSF. It was taken by TDLR and it is now against the VSF and will be in the VSF's um, history. So what I, what I would suggest is that the VSF start having conversations with enforcement about what happened. I mean, that's, that's their route of resolution. That, that is route. going on right now. Yes, that is. Okay. So that, I mean, again, we can put it on the agenda, but I think between Natalie and myself and and other folks and Todd, we've repeatedly directed it that way in many meetings. But Todd just popped up. I don't know if he wants to say something. Yeah, th there is a provision in 85710C. A person may not execute, submit, or use a department approved form or other documents which contain false, fictitious, dishonest, and fraudulent statements of material facts used for the purposes of obtaining possession or of access to a motor vehicle stored by a facility. And so there, there is a provision in there that we could theoretically um, look at if, if we believe fraud was used to execute that form. Uh, but Ken, I think what may be happening was that may have not been clear on the complaint or whatever in enforcement. Like you said, they're talking to enforcement. Um, it hasn't been prosecuted yet. Um, and that's part of the enforcement process that they may just be looking at it. I don't know. I, I, I'd be happy to look into that for you, or maybe Natalie could, um, since you have, I don't have access to legal files or anything. Why don't we go ahead and let's have staff follow up with Ken. Um, okay. Then if that answers, if that addresses the concern, um, then maybe it doesn't need to go on the agenda. If it doesn't answer the concern, if it doesn't, then maybe it does need to go on the agenda. I hope I said that the right way. You get what I'm saying. I, um, I understood you. Yes. Okay. So why don't we do that? Because we because we're we're sort of going into the whole discussion, which we can't do. So uh, let's have a tentative next to that item, Anna, and staff will follow up with Ken, and and we'll decide at a later date whether it goes on the agenda or not. Great solution. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The other thing I had on my list and correct me, I'm not sure if we decided or not notification fee, or are we going to not discuss that at the next meeting? Um, sure. Yeah, I think I said that I would, I would look to see if it was possible to, for us to address it. I think the preliminary answer is no, but I'm happy to look and come back at the next meeting and answer on the record. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that, that, oh, go ahead, Tasha, go ahead. Thank you. That that would be great because I there's questions, but you know we're I'm trying to make sure that we only have conversation or the discussion when it's allowable. Um, and so by at least having it on the agenda, we can ask some of the questions. And you know, um, and I, I would hate to wait again because we didn't know what the questions were. You know, so the, the topic of the notification fee is um, when. When is the notification fee addressed? Um, what would be the process if the fee were to need to be adjusted um, so that we have a better understanding of that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Who else? Um, um, Gary? I was going to say, I may or may not, I want to look at a little bit more, but may or may not want to talk about electric vehicles just a little bit more. 
because the state, and I know it's not TDLR, but the state through DMV is charging more for registration. So they're already seeing them as a separate type of vehicle. And I don't know if there's verbiage or wording in our part as far as the storage goes where we could see them as another type of vehicle or a vehicle that's not under what we're doing the other. I know you've looked at it some, but uh, if you don't mind looking at that, and I'll, I'll do some research on that too. Mm -hmm. Board members, what else would you like to see on your agenda next time? Nothing else? Okay. Anna, do we want to entertain dates and times, or are we going to do that at a later time since it's going to be? So, uh, like Elizabeth said, we'll probably be pulling uh, sometime before Christmas for a January or February uh, meeting date. But I'll, I'll send you an email, let y'all know. Okay, so that brings us to item K. So we're going to table that and she's going to pull you on that. Um, before we adjourn, I just want to address the board and all the listeners. I want to thank the department for the opportunity to serve. I thank you for giving me the honor and having faith in me to lead this group. It has been a true honor. Uh, I want to thank the industry for working with us and helping to progress the advisory board and the relationship with TDLR. I think we've come a long way in my 13 years of being on this board, and um, I'm, I'm just excited to see where it can go from here. I want to thank all of the board members, current, past, present, all of you. Um, your work is what makes this board productive, and it makes the relationship work better. I know it takes your time. I know it takes your effort, and um, it doesn't go unnoticed. I know the department all appreciates everything you're doing. So don't give up on that. Stick with it and keep helping to progress our industry. Um, I want to wish the department and the board nothing but continued success. And um, it's been a pleasure to serve. Thank you. Thank you. And and it yes, really a, a, a pleasure working with you. Um, I have seen a demonstrated um, change in the tenor of the interactions with the board under your leadership. And I greatly appreciate and honor you for that. Uh, I think it has gone a long way in, in helping us to become, uh, as an agency and industry, more cohesive and more responsive to each other, because this is a two-way relationship. Um, we need each other to do the best by the licensees. So I appreciate your leadership. You have always been available. Every time I needed to speak with you, you've always asked really interesting and probing questions that allowed me to get into further uh, understanding issues that the industry wanted to bring forward. So thank you for your service. We're sad to see you go after 13 years, uh, but maybe we will see you around uh, in other TDLR business because you are a valuable asset to the TDLR team. And we thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Okay. That makes us to our last item of adjourning. I need a motion to adjourn. Amy, just real quickly before we adjourn, I, I and I know that, you know, Sometimes this stuff isn't taken correctly, but I want to commend you for everything you've done on the board and for helping me transition into the board position after you'd been there. Um, you made it a lot easier and um, you and I have a professional relationship. I, my respect for you is is just immense. Um, and uh, I really appreciate everything that you do for this industry and all the hard work that you put in. And I can't think of any industry leader who is more on top of things than you are and that I have more respect for than I do for you. So thank you very much. Okay, that's enough. Y'all are going to make me cry. Thank you. Thank you all for your kind words. I, I have just totally enjoyed it. Um, okay, now I need a motion to adjourn, please. <laughs> Ken Ulmer makes a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I'll second Gary Hoffman. Thanks, Amy, for everything. You've done great. Thank yes, you. thank you, Amy. Thank, thank you. you all. Anna, we don't need a roll call on that, do we? Yeah. All right. My meeting's adjourned. I'm signing off. Good luck to everyone. Y'all have a great day. Thanks, Amy. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye.